Good evening, Mountaintop family and friends. So glad to be with you on tonight. Dr. House is at home resting, but she sends her love, sends her prayers for this Wednesday night midweek service. So glad to know that many of you are doing better. So glad we're moving through this pandemic and God is blessing us even in this dark and critical time for the world at large. Happy for you that have joined in with us on the prayer calls and you that was with us today in the prayer session. If you missed it, get ready next Wednesday at 12 o'clock. It's going to be a time of prayer. I want you to be a part of that. I want you to go with me tonight into the Word of God, going back to the book of Philippians. The last time I was ministering to you live, I had the Word of the Lord open to us in Philippians, the fourth chapter. We're going to pick up that tonight. Walk with me. Let's go through the scriptures and see what the Lord is saying to us during this time and in this season. In that fourth chapter, Paul is writing to the church of Philippi. Some call it Philippians. But he writes to them in verse 8. We want to pick up. The last time I believe we were speaking, we jumped in on verse 7. But he says here, I'm going to read it from the New International Version. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise worthy, meditate on these things. Verse 9, we may not get to it tonight, but we want you to just put that in your thought. It is the setting of this text or the subject tonight. Verse 9 says, These things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. And that's our lesson tonight. We want to move from the peace of God to the God of peace. In between these two scriptures, Paul sandwiches the peace of God, and he wants us to be introduced now to the God of peace. So as Paul is speaking to us in this verse, he opens this verse up with one word, and he says, finally. He says, this is a logical concept when he mentions a finally, because it speaks about forgiving, foregoing things that have just happened and bringing us on into those things and further explaining them. Um, we are introduced to this concept out of verse 7, and he says from there, he said, the peace of God, he says, we're going to guard our hearts and mind through the Lord Jesus Christ. But then in verse 9, he goes to us and he says, but the, the peace of God, the peace of God, peace with God, peace of God, and the peace of God. Time to tongue twisting, but it's hanging there. We're going to all work it out together. So here Paul is giving us here the essentials in verse 7. The essentials again are the peace of of God. And these essentials is that this peace of God is going to guard or rule our hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. He's on guard. He's protecting and watching over us even in this dark hour. And if you can parallel or correlate this Philippian church with our present time, which is dark and dreary, and we're going to get into more of that in just in a moment. But Paul is saying in the position he was writing from, God is still going to give us peace in the midst of this dark time. And that peace is coming through Christ Jesus. The principal application is applied now in verses 8 through 9, and he's talking about these general statements. In these general statements, as Christians, we should live out our lives thinking and doing. Say that with me, thinking and doing. We're going to get more into that. We're going to see what Paul is talking about as the God of peace. The God of peace, the peace of God. Now the God of peace is going to rule our hearts and going to watch over us as we move from thinking to doing. He says here himself, Paul is saying, is that Paul is saying himself he's experienced this peace. He opens here with an admonishment to this church that he loves so dear. And he also wants us to see his close relationship with them and how his heart was drawn towards them. The explanation here is clearly seen in many matters of Paul taking details to write to them. Let me give you a little background, not to be too teachy in the matter tonight, because we don't have a little church before I leave here. But Paul is talking about their care for him and their concern for him and how he is grateful for the good work that has been done in them is going to be done until the day of Jesus Christ. In many of Paul's writings, he could be writing and talking about something all of a sudden Paul would jump off in a whole nother thought that really sandwich in between what he's saying. And that's what he's doing here. He's talking about their care, but all of a sudden he stops and says, oh, think on these things. What are you talking about, Paul? We're going to get there. But he's rich of how he correlates and moves through his lesson to have us provoking 
provoked in our thoughts to think on these things. The Philippian church here, he writes to them, he's in Rome, he's in prison, he's on house arrest, Timothy is with him. But he's getting a letter from them about how their state is going and the care for him had kept flourishing. Not that he speaks in respect to want, but he knew their care for him kept coming. He's on this death row position and he's thinking of them and he's encouraging them and admonishing them through prayers and encouragement. And he also gives interpretation by the letter he sent to them that shows how much he loves them. Speaking about this peace of God and the God of peace. This teaching here shows us the inner tranquility of the constant joy. It's a con tranquility of constant joy and is influenced by what God has done for us and doing for us as he watched over, over our hearts. There's certain steps, he said, that you have to take, Clinton. You have to make sure that you watch these steps as you look for the peace of God and the God of peace to be guarded over your life. There are certain steps you must take. He said the mind, he speaks to us in this eighth verse, and he talks about the things that we should think on. And that's the mind being a sponge. Words can shape our lives and direct us. So we have to be careful the words what we hear and the activity that is coming into our spirits. Everybody's saying things and talking about what's going on in the world. And there's a lot going on around us, but the saints know that God is revealing things to us in secret. Don't let what you see in front of you be the answer of what's really going on. Because if God is in control, then he wants us to be at a certain amount of peace to know that he's going to reveal it to us in just a moment. Paul talks about these actions we must take. And he's, he says that we must be careful how we watch, watch what goes into our hearts and goes into our minds. He says we have to reprogram our minds, he's saying to us. And here's the reprogramming process through that eighth verse. He said, you must think on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure and lovely and admirable and excellence and things that are praiseworthy. You see it? He's talking about not things that are doom and gloom, but what's gonna bring my life to a praise and thank God for where, he, where I am right now in spite of what's going on. Please keep the painting in front of you. This guy is writing from a prison. He's on house arrest. But he's saying, I still got peace no matter where I'm at. I got a peace that's of God kind of peace that transcends all my understanding. He gives us here this example. He says, take this and apply these things. You apply these things by examination. The examination is thoughts that comes to our minds. What's flooding my mind? Or is it this true and honorable, right and pure and lovely, admonishing excellence? What sort of things are lovely, pure? Or is it television? Am I being consumed about what's going on in the world? Is it books that I'm reading? Is it my conversation, talking to the wrong people? This is not the season to be talking to negative people. Not right now. You're doing all you can to stay above in a positive mindset. He says, but take an examination of yourself. Anytime I found that I start doing self-examination, like most people, I'm harder on myself than I am on anybody else. So I know the things that are making me feel doom and gloom and pulling me down and missing this great peace that God has given me. He said, examine yourselves. What am I watching? Am I binging on Netflix and going to sleep and want to know why I'm working up nervous and scared and traumatized? Turn some of those movies off. Watch the magazines and books that I'm reading. One writer told me one day, I read a book. He says, every book turns you into another direction. Read all that you need, read all that you want, but careful that you don't start reading things that put you on a trail you can't recover from. After I've examined the things that are pulling me down, he's saying then apply or replace those things with, that are harming you with positive things, like the Word of God. You're in a season now that many of you are praying more, you're reading your Word more, you're meditating more and focusing on the things of God, those are the things that you want to keep doing for your life to let that God of peace abide with you. Refocus your mind on the things that are good and pure and, and be patient with yourself. It takes, it takes a lot of patience to do this, to focus off of negative things and start focusing on, on good things. So in this very verse 
uh, 8 of Philippians 4, uh, Paul is, is mentioning several things that I went over a few of, the, a few of them with you in another translation, but we'll straighten it out in just in a moment. But for King James and New King James translation, but the context is there. In verse 8, at the end of these things that he gives for instructions, he drops down at the bottom of the text and, and he says here uh, in the latter part, think on these things. Think. Think on these things. He mentioned this, these things. Think. Think is the word I want you to circle or underline. He talks about which, which means more than just keeping in mind. You know, you're thinking a thought. Uh, that's what uh, Muffet says. I'm thinking. Paul says, no, I'm just talking about, I'm just not talking about thinking a thought. He says, I rather want you to go into the account of the thing, the logos of the thing. Reflect upon what you're thinking about. Allow your thinking now to be a part of the conduit or the construction that will, sh that will reshape your behavior. That behavior now, he says, must be powerful. It must be something that can shape you. And these are the words that can shape you. Paul says in this scripture text, he says, it's so pure in heart when you think about it. And theologians have gathered this one verse, these two verses, eight and nine of Philippians four, and says, these verses here speaks of the biblical, it speaks of abbreviation of the descriptions of Christ throughout the whole Bible. Right in these few verses, he is true, he is noble, he is just, he is pure, he is lovely, and he is has a good report. All of those shape into the minds uh, are shaped into our mind who Christ really is in our life. Um, the illustration goes further here that when you think on these things and you meditate on these things or let these things shape your behavior, he says here that these things that you think on is like, uh, um, I call it like a, a crew or a cup. It's like chewing cup. It's kind of gross, but go with me with the thought. Chewing cup, crub, is not like chewing tobacco. No, it speaks of an animal, like a sheep or a cow, and how if you ever notice them on TV or you that like me grew up on a farm, when the cow is chewing the hay or chewing or the, or the sheep is eating the grass, that they're, they're eating on this, this cub. And they're, they're chewing it, and, but it's not being swallowed yet. They're chewing it over and over again. And if it is swallowed, it is regurgitated. I know it's gross. Stay with me. It comes back up. And when it comes back up, they chew it more in their mouths. And their expression here becomes chewing cup or chewing it but not swallowing it yet. Why do you tell me all that gross stuff, Pastor? Because you need to know how to get the word that's in you back up out of you and let that word regurgitate in your mouth again. And the Bible says it's sweet as honey in the honeycomb. And when it goes down this time, it's going to bring all the nutrients that you need to get stronger. So, so the ingredients here is chewing cub. What's the meditation that takes place? Meditation or pondering similar expressions is the same thing as chewing the cub. So tonight, we're going to chew it a bit. We're going to go back over simple principles and dig into it again and see how this word that's in you can be regurgitated to bring about life. So Paul says, think on these things. I want you to be concerned about your mental reflection. I'm concerned about what you're reflecting upon. And I want you to be able to look at this and let it promote good behavior. Um, remember I told you some years ago how some of you grew up in your mama's house and now you got your own place. But you're walking around turning off lights and unplugging TVs because that's the way you grew up. But then soon you realize this is my house. Leave the TV on, leave the lights on till you get the power bill. But certain things bless you because what you were taught and what the instructions that you got, every now and then you hear mama, big mama, as auntie them, somebody that grew up, that trained you and raised you, those good things come back up. And that's what Paul is telling the church at Philippi. I want these things to come back up in your spirit and know that they're going to give you life. People, uh, moral standards always uh, are, are better in behavior. Some people, some of our moral standards 
are always better than behavior. Say it slow. Some of our moral standards are better than our behavior. I have good standards, but I don't have good behavior sometimes. I just get carried away. But Paul says, if you think on these things, you rest on those things that are pulling you away from the Lord. This is the way of true salvation. The gospel here is chewing on the cub and biting down on the rich things that God has given us. As Christians, our lives should be controlled under the influence and the demand of the gospel. Chew on that. Romans gives us this expression in 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, it's the gospel that I'm not ashamed of. It's the, God, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. It's also knowing in that same context. I'm sorry that I paraphrase it. He says, for, his, if for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For the just, for it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's something you have to sit back and meditate on, to not be moved for where we are right now. This is our life. And I told you, you're growing from that Sunday school faith and from that kindergarten faith, from that I need a job faith, to walking in another level of faith to keep the virus out of your house, off your family, out the door, and stay the hand of the enemy. This growth, he says also, that he wants them to grasp onto, hold on to, according to 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. Just catch my scriptures, write them down. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, it says, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing in every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the mind thought is happening now. My understanding has to be strong enough to pull down anything that comes up against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Clearly, you can see it in Romans 12 and 2. And do not be conformed to this world and be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Don't let this world change you. Don't allow yourself to change to fit into the world. You're not of this world or this age. You're a different walk and a different believer. You're not just anybody. You are a true born child of God. You have to meditate on that, chew on that, and think on those things. He says here also that we're in a period of danger. When, when in a period of danger, you have a place to escape. And that escape being is in the God of peace. And in that God of peace, I realize I can think on things that can bring me or shift my energy into the place where I have peace with God. Things are going crazy all around me, but I have peace with God. Paul goes on in this text, and as, as I move you forward, and I won't get all these scriptures into you tonight, but note here as he talks about us thinking and doing, thinking and doing. Thinking is one thing, but doing, of course, is another. And he wants to admonish them to move from thinking to doing. I see it in Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter, and verse 24 to 26 particularly. He talks about whosoever heareth, these sayings of mine, and does them or do them, I will like them unto a wise man that build his house upon a rock. And then when the rains descended and the floods came, he says the wind blew and beat up on that house, but and it did not fall. Say that right to me, say I'm not gonna fall because I'm building on a solid foundation because my hearing is right, so my structure is solid. But the foundation was built upon a rock. James says in his context, in James 1, in verse 21 and through 27, but particularly verse James 1 and 23, said, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, uh, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He said, but verse 24, he goes on and says, for he observes himself and goes away immediately and forgets what kind of man he was or man in mankind, ladies. What kind of person am I? You've been looking in this mirror for years, years you've been looking into this mirror. You've been reading scriptures. Some of you grew up with a big family Bible on the living room table or somewhere on a big table. Word all around you. And that word has been digested inside of you. But now you have to bring it back up. And let that word become flesh inside of you and live to understand the God of peace is living in your home. This word James it says you cannot be a forgetful hearer, forgetful hearer of it like you appear in a mirror and forget what you even look like. Tonight, I'm looking at you in this camera. I looked and made sure I was halfway presentable. I need a haircut, but don't worry about that. I'm going to get it done. So I forgot what I looked like. I can't really 
give you a description on what I look like. But in my spirit, man, I know the power of God resides. I know in whom I have believed. I'm confident he's going to bring me through this and you through this and we're going to be all right. That's the knowing of the mirror reflection. But in Romans, he says that they forgot what they saw. They forgot who they were. Romans 1, 8 through 21. Um, you should know this. They knew God. Didn't glorify him as God. Became vain in their imagination. Evil's hearts were darkened, darkened. And God gave them over to what they wanted to believe. If you don't believe in faith and trusting God now, he'll give you over to doubt. Not that he wants to release you, but he cannot operate where there's doubt. It cannot be in the same space. So either I'm going to walk in faith, trust and believe God, or else I'll walk in this dismal darkness that's all around me. Paul knew this darkness very well. He wanted the Christian life, the Christian believer, to understand that the manifestation of our lives is not being remodeled. You're not being remodeled right now. You have been transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are a brand new creature. According to 2 Corinthians, I believe 5 and 17, it says, you are a new person in Christ. Old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. new. So in the context, Paul says the ethical system here, he uses something because of the setting he was in. Uh, hang with me just a few more moments. Because of the setting he was in, he used a stoic presentation. Think on these things. The Stoics believe in Acts, I believe the 16th chapter, they believe they had the philosophy of the time and of the era, and they were wise enough to believe that whatever they thought, they could think themselves into something great. So Paul, because he knew they were around, he writes this to Philippians, and the Philippians is saying, Paul, what are, why are you using these terminology? Think on these things. Because these things are true, directed to the right person. But to the Stoics and the Epicureans, they thought they could philosophize their way to understand God. But Paul says it's not good enough. It was not a value to them, but there, these things are value to us. Pure and lovely, noble, pure and lovely, good report, he says, and praiseworthy. These things are a good report to us. The Epicureans didn't believe in any God. They, also, they believed that the chief concept of a man's life was to do whatever you want to do, have pleasure, and that's the end of life. Isn't that a good philosophy? Until you wake up and have to meet the Lord. Your life is not one in a philosophy. I'm not trying to even be philosophical tonight. I'm just giving you some little history. The Stoics believed in fate. Not faith. Fate. And they believed in the fate that it was a place of development in life. It just happened to you. Some of you are walking around and wondering, well, because I didn't give, because I wasn't faithful, because of this, uh, uh, this, this is not my fate in life. You're not a fate believer. You are a fate believer. If God wanted to do you and me wrong and take us out, he had to wait for a pandemic. He could have took us out a long time ago. But the just, Paul says, is going to live by faith. He's growing us up, church. That's all it is. These, these, these stoics, I thought that they're, and also the Epicureans, I may not be saying it right, go dictionary, go Google it. But in Acts 17 chapter, you can see them. They thought that their philosophy would change everything. But Paul says, you got the right idea, but you have the wrong application. Let me put it in illustration before I close tonight. The illustration to them was that they can think themselves and philosophy and be better. And there are people around you probably in your job that feel the same way. Watch it like this, the illustration. Rich people say, I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do a deep cleaning. I'm going to go meditate. I'm going to eat, eat some, some veggies. I'm going to get myself all together. I'm going to get myself physically ready and fit. I'm going to come back with a clean mind. How long that's going to last? How long will that last? That's partially good, but it has no end result because the body is going to the grave someday. You can do all you can to keep it cleaned up. But you got to think about your future, not for your present now. The illustration is thinking, well, I'm going to get myself cleaned up. Paul is saying, I'm going to get you so together that after you get through with this pandemic, the God of peace is going to reign in your life. You can have something that the world don't have. You're going to go back to your jobs. People will say, I almost lost my mind. You said, I found my mind. It was being transformed by the renewing of Christ. These people are watching all these things on television and trying to find peace, but there is no peace. Going to spas, going out to do things that bring about life back to a joyful place. But the saints are sitting at home saying, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world 
can't take it away. Paul goes on to talk about the believer's life and I want you to know about the cross. The cross was his, it was his story and the main thing he wanted to speak about. The cross bring about power and deliverance. You can see it in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18. It says, I'm not coming to you with the, the, the with this foolishness, but I'm talking with you, coming to you with the cross. I'm sorry. In 1 Corinthians 1 18, I'm coming bringing the cross because the cross is the power of God. To the Greeks, it's a stumbling block. To the to the to the Greek, I'm sorry. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. But but to us, Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, it goes in that same context. It says, I didn't come to excellence of speech, nor did I come with you with, with, with kind words or philosophies. I'm paraphrasing it. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. But I came with demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. This here Paul is saying and understanding the influence of your life is influenced by thought. It's a thought life. What you hear is going to shape your life. What you're hearing is going to understand the peace that God has given you is living with you right now. That you're going through a storm, but you're coming out victoriously. Paul speaks about the exaltation, about thinking of good things, things that are true. The exaltation is things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are good report. Let these things reside in you and be in you and let these things become the virtue of your life. Virtue now describes the quality of excellence. The excellence come from the designing of anything that is praiseworthy. He's talking to these episodians, people that are around them, but telling the believer, you got something in you that is praiseworthy and brings about excellence and it brings about power and deliverance. And that's the peace of God. This virtue is seen in the Romans. They're noted by universal human uh, uh, human approval. Everybody wants to be approved. You win a race, you want to get an applause. When you when you, it's your birthday, you want to get an applause. People are looking for approval, but I'm looking for God's approval. I want him to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Paul has said, if that's what you're looking for, then think on these things. And the God of peace, not just anybody, but God will come and reside and set in your life and set in your hearts thinking of what's noble and pure and honest and a good report. This is what we want, church. This is where we're moving to. And Paul is exalting us and exhorting us to look at God again, regurgitate that word that's in your heart and in your mind, and let that peace of God sit on you. Walk around your house. I know you ain't going too far, but in them house shoes and in that house robe, walking around saying, God's got this thing under control. And not only do I have the peace of God, I got the God of peace living right in my house and living right in my heart. There's something happening to the church right now. He says in Ephesians 3 and 20, he says, listen, now to him that is able to do immeasurable more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. Read it again if you can. Ephesians 3 and 20, there is something immeasurable happening inside the church. Something is building up on the inside. My illustration tonight, I didn't bring it, but have you ever seen a balloon at a birthday party? And the person comes in and the balloons are all deflated. But as soon as he put the balloon on the helium tank or someone's mouth, that balloon blows back up. You might have been deflated, but I tell you, there's something inside of you that's going to swell you back up. That's the God of peace. So going to give you life you have not experienced yet. And he brings you back up with new air and new life and new peace because he wants you to live. You have not been to the place of depletion that God's going to leave you there, but something is stirring inside of you and it's called the God of peace. He's giving you a new fire, a new flicker. You're praying at a whole new level. The word is becoming revelatorial as you read it now because you're going through a storm at this very time. But you know without doubt, if God God be with you. Nobody else can be against you. Let this God of peace rule, reign, and abide with you. How do I do it, Pastor? Think, child. Think on these things. Whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, whatever is good, whatever is a good report, and because of those things, and because of those qualities that's in your life, you ain't got nothing to be praised for. Any praise you get, go to God. Anything that's good that's happening in your life, it ain't about you. It's about the God of peace that lives inside of you that's giving you something to be praiseworthy about. So walk around and tell yourself, God's living in my house and I got something to praise him for. There is no doubt. There is no fear. Where he lives, 
where he abides and where that God comes and resides, any doubt, any fear, any disbelief got to go. It cannot be around God because he demands peace. You know this, Peter, when he stood up on the boat and said, peace be still, everything had to lay down. And he's speaking right now in your life. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the God of peace reign, rest, rule, and abide forever. Revelation says, and also Romans, that the enemy is going to be put up on your feet real soon. Who's going to do it? The God of peace. He's a blessing in our lives, church. He's amazing to be on our side. I would not want to be on the losing side when I could be on the winning side. God bless you. I love you. I'm going to see you real soon. But listen.